And after I pulled the bloody towel back, I saw a deceased newborn. Put my hand down there. Call the baby's out. There was no plan for these babies to live. Ultimately, I'm paying the bigger price because I don't have those twin babies in my life. Most people would agree that infants are meant to be loved and treasured. They are a gift to each and every family who has the privilege of creating a new life. However, some people see these miracles as nothing but inconveniences, something that is getting in the way of them living the life they want to live, which doesn't involve caring for another life. And instead of giving that child to a family who will love and care for them, some people simply want to get rid of them in the most selfish and brutal ways possible. That is what happened in today's case. Two tiny little babies who never got a chance at life, who were born to the wrong person and were killed because one woman didn't want them around. With that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Lindsay Lowe was born and raised in a well-off family in Hendersonville, Tennessee with her mother, father, and younger sister, Lacey. Growing up, Lindsay was involved in all sorts of school activities such as swimming and dance. She was always extremely close with her family, she did well in school, and mostly kept to herself. By 2005, Lindsay went off to college at Western Kentucky University. But while there, her mother, Paula, was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor that was the size of an orange. Obviously, this is a devastating diagnosis and required surgery to remove. After her mother had her surgery, her entire personality changed. She had once been a homemaker who took care of the kids, the house, and her husband while also working her own job. But after the surgery, she could no longer take care of basic household duties such as cooking, cleaning, organizing, or even making financial decisions. She went through severe mood swings and just was not the same person she previously was. After her mother's surgery, while finishing out her degree, Lindsay would come home as often as she could to help her mom and dad out around the house. On the weekends, she would pick up groceries, clean, and do any other chores that needed to be done. During this time, while in school, Lindsay met and started dating a man named Jonathan Brooks, and by 2008, the two were engaged. That same year, Lindsay graduated from college with her degree. Once she graduated, she moved back in with her parents so she could help her mother full time. According to Lindsay's father, Mark, Lindsay was the model daughter. She was everything you could ask for. She was selfless, caring, and just wanted to do her part in making sure her mother was cared for. By 2009, her fiance, Jonathan, graduated from his college program and moved out on his own. Around that same time, Jonathan's own mother became ill, so he too wanted to be around her to take care of her. Of course, with them living in separate cities, both dealing with so much family stress, their relationship started to become more distant. But still, they stayed together and tried to fight for their relationship while also taking care of everything else going on in their lives. By spring of 2011, unfortunately, Jonathan's mother passed away from her illness. Around that same time, Lindsay's mother also received the devastating news that her brain tumor was back. By this point, Lindsay was still living with her parents and helping out around the house. She also never got the chance to work in her field with her degree during this time. Instead, she worked at a dental office near home doing insurance and billing stuff. That way, she could always be near the home while driving her mom back and forth to hospital visits for radiation therapy for her tumor. By the weekend of September 10th, 2011, Lindsay was a bridesmaid in her friend's wedding, which took place in Kentucky. There, she had a great time with friends, getting all dressed up, getting her hair and makeup done. The wedding went as planned, or about as planned as any wedding can go, and Lindsay and a friend drove home from Kentucky back to Hendersonville on that Sunday, September 11th. That night, the friend slept over with Lindsay before the two women got up the next day and went to work. That Monday, September 12th, went as any normal day at first. Lindsay was texting her sister about going to a concert together. She was also talking with her fiancé about a trip they had coming up. By that evening, Lindsay came home complaining of a stomach ache. According to family, she pretty much spent the entire evening just sitting in the bathroom. 
Lindsay's mother and father each came and checked on her several times throughout the evening to see if she was okay. Each time, Lindsay told her parents through a closed door that she was fine, but she wasn't feeling well and thought that she might have a stomach bug, asking to be left alone. This was how Lindsay was when she was sick, even from the time she was a kid. She just wanted to be left alone to be sick in silence. I totally understand that feeling. By around 10.39 p.m. that evening, Lacey, Lindsay's sister, texted Lindsay from inside the home saying, let me know if you need anything, love you, good night. From there, most of the family went to bed. By the following morning, Tuesday, September 13th at 6.03 a.m., Lindsay texted her supervisor telling her that she had been sick all night and still was not feeling well. She said that she couldn't come to work that day, but was sure that she would be better by the following day. By that point, Lindsay had a return to her bedroom, still lying in bed and feeling like shit. Lacey got up around that same time, went to the bathroom that she shared with Lindsay, and then got Lindsay a glass of water before leaving for work. Soon after, Lindsay's mother and father both also left for work, leaving Lindsay alone in the home all day to recover from her stomach bug. All throughout that day, Lindsay was just chilling and relaxing. She was watching some TV, spent some time texting various people. She texted her fiance, telling him she loved him. She sent messages to a friend who was pregnant and due at any moment, talking about how excited they were for the baby's arrival. She also texted her sister about the concert they had planned. And of course, they talked about the flu she was dealing with. She actually told her sister that she never went to bed that prior night. Instead, she was lying on the bathroom floor all night. Clearly, she did not feel good at all. The day after that, Lindsay went back to work at the dental office. By around 8 a.m., she had been texting back and forth with her father. Then by 8.30 a.m., she was texting her fiance still about the trip they had coming up. However, as Lindsay was at work, both of her parents were still at home getting ready for their days. As Lindsay's mother, Paula, was getting ready, she went into Lindsay's room to do some laundry for her, as she sometimes did. Especially now, after Lindsay was sick for those two days, Paula wanted to help out. But as she was doing so, according to Mark, he suddenly heard her scream his name in a panicked tone. He rushed over to see what was going on, and that is when Paula told him that she had found a tiny little infant in Lindsay's room. Mark went in to look a bit closer, and he saw that there was, in fact, a newborn baby in that room. The baby was found still and not moving, unresponsive to any stimuli. According to Mark, in that moment, he just went into a state of shock. He stared at this child for 15 minutes, just standing there, not knowing what to do. I'm sure those 15 minutes felt like two seconds in that moment. Once he came to, he first dialed a friend who worked as an attorney who then told Mark to call his pastor. He did just that, and the pastor told him that he would head over to the house, but said to call the police in the meantime. After hanging up, finally, by 8.30 a.m., Mark dialed 911 to report what he had found. On the call, Mark told the dispatcher that his daughter had gone to work, but that there was a child in her room, and this child was not alive. By that point, both Mark and his wife went downstairs and waited for the authorities to arrive. When the first officer arrived, Mark told him that his daughter, 25-year-old Lindsay, had been sick all day the prior day. That morning, his wife went to clean her room for her, and that is when they found this baby. The officer went upstairs to look for himself, and there he found a tiny infant baby boy lying in a laundry basket near the bed covered in a sheet and a bloody towel. The officer noticed that the baby was cold to the touch and had already been deceased. He was beyond help, so resuscitation efforts were not attempted. When examining his tiny body, he wasn't rigid. He was actually already past the state of rigor mortis, meaning that he had died over 12 hours prior. The baby appeared to have been healthy at birth, full term, no signs of distress during the delivery, it was estimated that this baby weighed about five pounds. After examining that baby within the basket, an officer started to remove the baby from the basket in order to place him on the bed. But as they removed the sheet and lifted him up, they found that the baby's umbilical cord was attached to something in that basket. 
This led the officer to start searching in that basket, removing some of the clothing items and sheets to find whatever else was still in that basket. It was at that time that this officer found a second baby boy in that laundry basket. It was the twin brother who appeared to be a little bit smaller than the first baby, weighing only around three pounds. At that point, officers removed the babies from the home, sending them off to the medical examiner's office for further examination. By that point, officers had obtained a search warrant, so they started searching more areas of that home. The first thing that stood out to officers was that there was no sign of anything related to a baby in that home. There were no baby clothes, no toys, no baskets, no food, no bottles, nothing you would need to care for a baby. Then, they found that there was a small amount of blood in the bathroom where Lindsay had spent the night on the floor two nights prior. There was also blood on a small patch of carpet in Lindsay's bedroom. Then, in Lindsay's closet, officers found numerous bloody towels and sheets, several pairs of bloody underwear and pajama pants, as well as a bloody shirt. The details of the criminal case were shocking. And after I uh, pulled the bloody towel back, I saw a deceased newborn. As that was happening, another officer went to Lindsay's work to speak with her and see if she would willingly come into the station, which she did. At first, officers asked her if she knew why she was taken in, and she was smiling, happy, and cooperative, acting like she had no idea. Her face and demeanor changed real quick when they told her they found her laundry basket. At the start of the interview, Lindsay admitted to the officer that she had known she was pregnant the entire time. So basically, the whole nine months it takes to grow a baby, she knew she was pregnant. She said that she noticed her period stopped, she was gaining weight, and she even started lactating shortly before she gave birth. She said that she didn't tell anyone, not her family, not her fiance, about her pregnancy because she was worried they would be disappointed. She grew up in a conservative Christian household, so she felt like they would be really upset if they knew. She told detectives that the babies belonged to her fiance, Jonathan. But then the officer pushed her a bit and asked her if there was any possible way the babies could belong to anybody else. And at that point, she admitted that she had cheated on her fiance. Sometime around April or May of 2010, Lindsay met a man named Jeremy Smith through her cousin's husband. The two started texting back and forth, and eventually they started going on dates, despite the fact that Lindsay was engaged and Jeremy had a girlfriend of his own. They went on a total of three dates and ended up having sex two times. The first time they wore protection, but the last time, which was around December of 2010, they did not. But after this final time, by January of 2011, Lindsay stopped returning Jeremy's calls. She told him that she was no longer interested and returned to focusing on her fiancé, Jonathan. Of course, she told the detective that she never told Jonathan about this or her pregnancy because she didn't want to lose him. Still, she was pretty sure that Jonathan was the father. Lindsay explained that on the weekend of September 10th, she went to that wedding in Kentucky, as I mentioned earlier. There, she also didn't tell anyone about her pregnancy. I also want to note that throughout this entire time, not a single person noticed her pregnancy. At work, she typically wore scrubs and a jacket. At home, she always wore baggy t-shirts. Then, at this wedding, the dress she had tried on in January still fit her even though she was nine months pregnant. She even changed in front of the other bridesmaids, laughing and posing for pictures, no one having a clue that she was literally nine months pregnant and about to pop. After the wedding, she went to work that Monday. While at work, she noticed her stomach hurting, so when she got home, she skipped dinner and went straight to the bathroom. By around 6.30, she started to experience intense low back pain. By around 10 p.m., Lindsay stated that she felt like she had to use the restroom, thinking that she was going to have a bowel movement. So she went, but instead of having a bowel movement, a baby popped out and fell in the toilet. When that happened, Lindsay was shocked, I guess. She immediately laid on the bathroom floor and started crying, leaving the baby in the toilet, not checking on him or seeing if he was underwater. After his birth, he cried for less than a minute before he just stopped. After a few minutes of lying on the floor, she got back up 
and delivered her second baby into the toilet on top of that first baby. This second baby never cried. Lindsay thought that maybe he hit his head on the bowl or something like that when he was born. Either way, after giving birth a second time, she went and lied back on the floor. After giving birth, she did not look at either baby. She didn't even know the gender of each baby. She didn't see if they were moving. Nothing. For the hour that followed, Lindsay just lied still on the floor, not knowing what to do while those babies stayed in the toilet bowl. During that hour, her parents came to the door several times to check on her, and each time she asked to be left alone. Again, she spoke to them through a closed door. She lied on the floor until 3 a.m., when finally she got up, grabbed a towel, and took the babies out of the toilet and put them into that basket. She then cleaned up the bathroom and washed herself off before going in her room and laying in bed. She basically lied around all day the following day, switching between the couch and her bed. During that time, she didn't check on the babies. She didn't look at them a single time. She then went to work the following day, leaving those babies in that basket. At that point, she had absolutely no plan for what she was going to do with the babies. She also mentioned that even though her mom does her laundry for her, she did not think her mom would find those babies. Now, when Lindsay was telling detectives this story, there were some parts that seemed a bit hard to believe. And the way Lindsay was acting, how she was talking, all of that, made detectives believe that Lindsay was feeling guilty. They felt that she was leaving some things out. Obviously, the fact that she said she never even looked at those babies in the toilet until much later just doesn't seem right. Also, she said that these babies barely even cried after she delivered them. But as we heard from before, these babies appeared to have been born healthy without complications. When a healthy baby is born, they will cry a lot. That is how you know they're healthy. So these few things just really didn't seem right at this point. So detectives told Lindsay that the medical examiner was going to be performing an autopsy on those babies. And if anything else happened to them, the ME would find it. If they were hit, if they were drowned, shaken, smothered, the medical examiner would know. The detective told Lindsay if there was more to the story they should know, she needs to tell them right away. She had been cooperative up to this point. They know she's a good person who maybe has made some mistakes. If she wants to maintain that trust between them, she needed to tell them everything. It was at this time when Lindsay admitted that when the babies were born, she did in fact take a look at them and she knew their gender. She didn't just pop them out and leave them in the toilet without looking. She said that when the first baby was born, he was crying a lot. So she put her hand over his mouth to try and keep him quiet. She said her hand wasn't there for too long and she specifically said that she didn't smother him. She just wanted to keep him quiet. So she put her hand over his mouth until he stopped crying. She then did the same with the second baby, though the second baby didn't cry as long as the first one. Put my hand down there. Oh, the baby's mouth. How long would you say you did that for? Till it stopped crying? After saying that out loud, the detective basically summarized what she said, and she agreed at that time that she did kill those babies. She knew that putting her hand over their mouths would stop them from breathing. She knew that stopping them from crying meant that she was stopping them from breathing. She killed two innocent babies. As I stated, those twin babies were sent to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. The ME found that the gestational age of those babies was 40 weeks, meaning they were delivered right on time. Both babies weighed 6.5 pounds, were born healthy without any birth defects or other problems. Their lungs were healthy and aerated, meaning that they were alive and breathing when they were born. They weren't stillborns or anything like that. The medical examiner stated that due to the fact that they were both born healthy, the manner of death is most likely homicide. He believes the babies were smothered to death. However, the lack of injuries to the twins made it so he couldn't say this definitively. It's possible that the way the babies were lying on top of each other in that toilet caused them to suffocate. 
It's also possible that the prolonged exposure to that cold toilet water could have caused them hypothermia, leading to their deaths. Babies can't regulate their body temperatures well, so that's also a possibility. However, the ME does believe that they were most likely smothered to death based on the autopsy, as well as using what Lindsay told investigators. The ME also completed a DNA test and found that Jeremy Smith is in fact the father of these twins, not Lindsay's fiance, Jonathan. To me, in my opinion, I think that Lindsay knew very well who the father was of her children and that is part of the reason why she hit her pregnancy. Because I do think if it was Jonathan, her fiance, she would know that her parents would be a lot more accepting of her having babies with the man she was about to marry. Obviously, Jonathan would have probably been pretty excited about this, but I think she knew whether she knew it for sure or just in the back of her head, I think she knew that Jonathan was not the father. Based on everything we've discussed up to this point, Lindsay was ultimately arrested and charged with two counts each of first-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. The trial started by September of 2013. The prosecution was arguing that Lindsay found out that she was pregnant, and instead of doing anything about it, she chose to ignore it, pretend that it wasn't happening. She hid her pregnancy from everyone until she simply couldn't hide it anymore. While pregnant, Lindsay never intended on caring for those babies. As I stated before, despite knowing she was pregnant, there was no sign of any preparation in her home. No diapers, no bottles, nothing. As the pregnancy progressed, she knew that she was going to get rid of those babies in one way or another. When the time came that she couldn't hide her pregnancy anymore, she murdered those babies, all because she didn't want to admit that she was pregnant. When she was asked how these babies met their deaths on, May, on uh, September 12, 2011, the defendant, in her own words, as the state intends for you to hear, in an interview with Detective Malik says, I just put my hand down there over their mouth, the baby's mouth. Not long until it stopped crying. And when asked about the second child, she replied, well, it was just the same thing. I mean, it wasn't as much, I guess, crying or anything. She even hid the babies for two days in a room. These babies were delivered, as the proof will show, on September the 12th. They were not discovered until September the 14th, hidden by her bed in a laundry basket. There was no plan, facts will, the state will intend to show, there, were no, there was no plan for these babies to live. You will hear testimony of officers who conducted a search of the house once the babies were found. Those officers will tell you that during their search they found no evidence whatsoever of the expectation of life of a child at that residence. There was no diapers, there was no passy, no formula, no blankets. No baby beds, no car seat. The evidence will show that none of that existed. Why? Because the defendant hid pregnancy. Several friends, co-workers, and family members all testified at trial. Her sister said that she did notice Lindsay gaining a little bit of weight during her pregnancy, but said that she had always fluctuated with her weight all throughout her life, so she didn't think anything of it. She had no idea she was pregnant. Same goes for co-workers. She was always wearing scrubs and a jacket, and even if she did gain weight, she didn't look pregnant. Then, when it came to the wedding she was in, the dress she had tried on literally nine months earlier still fit her despite being nine months pregnant. She also changed in front of the other bridesmaids and spent an entire weekend with her close friend, even sharing a bed with her to sleep. Yet still, nobody could tell that she was pregnant. However, as we heard from before, Lindsay did admit that she knew she was pregnant pretty much the entire time. This is also confirmed with some Google searches Lindsay made on her phone. In September of 2011, she made searches for things like pregnancy calculator, things to make you go into labor, and how to make yourself go into labor. Lindsay knew that she was pregnant, but hid it from the world. She didn't want to disappoint her parents. She didn't want to lose her fiance, and she probably just simply didn't want to be a mother. 
For all of those reasons, instead of putting them up for adoption or saying if the biological father wanted them, she took the most selfish route possible and murdered those babies, giving them absolutely no chance at life. However, the defense was claiming that Lindsay is not guilty due to reason of diminished capacity. It's pretty obvious in this case that Lindsay had those babies and then she was the one who caused their deaths. She was the one who left them in the toilet and then put them in the laundry basket. She didn't feed them. She didn't take care of them in any way. She is the reason that they are dead and there's no way around that. But the defense is basically saying that she didn't do this on purpose. It wasn't out of malice. She didn't murder those babies. It was because she lacked the mental capacity to take care of them. Because of this defense, Lindsay had been examined by multiple psychiatrists, one of which interviewed her for over 13 hours. This psychiatrist was Dr. Kenner, and he testified at trial that Lindsay is a quiet, timid, passive person who freezes or becomes numb in challenging situations. He explained that Lindsay was born with a bladder malformation, which led to her dealing with bladder infections, spasms, and incontinence from ages 3 to 13. She underwent multiple surgeries for this and was constantly in pain. This was also something she was embarrassed about growing up. Of course, being a kid at school with a bladder issue is never fun. Due to the pain and embarrassment, Lindsay would often go into a disassociative state. When in this state, she felt that these issues were happening to someone else. That is how she coped. Even after her bladder issues were addressed, Lindsay continued to struggle with disassociation. She would go through entire classes in high school and leave that class with no memory of ever even being in the class. Anytime she faced a stressful situation, she would dissociate and pretend that it wasn't happening. Dr. Kenner ended up diagnosing her with PTSD, chronic depression, and disassociative disorder. At the trial, Lindsay also claimed that her affair with Jeremy was actually non-consensual. She claimed that he date-raped her. The first time they got together, she said that Jeremy pressured her into sleeping with him despite her telling him no. She said that she eventually gave in to get it over with, but she has spotty memory of the entire thing because she was disassociating during it. The second time they got together, she said that she was at a party when he showed up. She said that she doesn't remember anything after he showed up, but she knows that they slept together because once again, she was disassociated the entire time. However, I do want to note that there were text messages found between the two of them where they're talking about marriage and how into each other they are. Now, with that being said, being into someone and texting them and flirting with them, that does not mean that you consent to having sex with them. However, I do imagine that if someone was pressuring you and forcing you to have sex, you might not be open to texting them as much after you might want to cut them off. She did eventually cut him off, but she also was engaged to another man. So did she cut him off because he was assaulting her or because she realized that she needed to focus on her fiance and that this was just a big mistake? We really don't know. Obviously, Jeremy denied the rape accusations and I'm not in the business of making false accusations or of not believing women. So I just wanted to give you both sides and I will let you all come to your own conclusions of what you think happened. Either way, based on all of that, Dr. Kenner testified at trial that Lindsay suffered from pregnancy denial, which is common in instances of trauma and rape. Pregnancy denial is actually kind of crazy because it's not just psychological, but it can have physical symptoms as well. For example, a woman in denial may carry the baby so that it's sitting vertically in utero so that she doesn't show as much. She may not have even had many pregnancy symptoms either, such as nausea. With someone in pregnancy denial, Dr. Kenner said that they do have lucid moments where they acknowledge they're pregnant, but 99% of the time, Lindsay probably didn't even consider herself pregnant. There were times throughout the pregnancy where Lindsay may have had an oh shit, I'm pregnant moment, possibly when making those Google searches, but the rest of the time, she acted as if she were not pregnant. Dr. Kenner went on to acknowledge that yes, Lindsay admitted to officers that she knew she was pregnant the whole time, but that realization was most likely made in retrospect after the fact. She may have known deep down 
but she was in denial most of the time. At the time when she gave birth to the babies, she didn't necessarily mean to smother her babies. When she put her hand on them, she wasn't necessarily trying to cover their mouth. She couldn't really feel exactly where she was touching that baby because she wasn't looking. Then, once they were delivered, Lindsay went into hypovolemic shock due to blood loss. As Lindsay said earlier, after giving birth, she felt dizzy and laid on the floor, shaking, unable to move. This could be due to blood loss while giving birth. Dr. Kenner said that someone with this kind of blood loss can suffer from delirium and confusion similar to what a dementia patient can experience. At the time of the births, Lindsay did not have the mental capacity to knowingly commit the crimes she's being accused of. At the trial, Lindsay's defense made the choice for her not to testify. Again, she is very much withdrawn, she is meek and introverted, and would rather have a doctor fill in the gaps and tell her story than recount anything from her own memory. She told the courts earlier that she couldn't emotionally handle testifying, which honestly was probably true. She had a ton of moments of breaking down and crying, going into hysterics all throughout the trial. The defense needed multiple breaks just to get Lindsay to calm down. After hearing the testimony from both sides, the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments. After this, the jury was sent off for deliberations. And they actually only deliberated for two hours before they came back with their verdict. They found that 26-year-old Lindsay Lowe is guilty on all charges, including two counts of child abuse and two counts of first-degree felony murder. At the sentencing, Lindsay received an outpouring of support from friends and family members. They had sent the courts 86 letters of support, all talking about how Lindsay is an amazing, kind, caring person who just made a mistake. She was selfless and giving, always committed to her family, friends, and the church. She never had a history of criminal behavior. She wasn't a risk to the public. She has the ability to make a full recovery if given the proper rehabilitation. Despite this, at the end of the sentencing hearing, the judge handed her two consecutive life sentences for her crimes. After the verdict, Lindsay did appeal her conviction. And after serving nine years behind bars, the original judge in Lindsay's trial actually decided that she should get a new trial. The judge determined that there was a juror who had already made up their mind about Lindsay's guilt before getting onto the jury. Someone who wanted to get onto that jury so she could influence the other jurors to get a guilty verdict. According to Lindsay's father, he witnessed this juror fist pump when she was selected. As a result of this stealth juror, the judge felt that Lindsay deserves a new trial. The verdict was vacated and a new trial was ordered. For the time being, Lindsay was given a $75,000 bond, which she posted. She was then released and returned to living with her parents for the time being. The jury convicted Lowe on two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced her to life in prison. But now, nine years later, Lowe is free, awaiting a new trial. In a stunning development, her defense attorney, Kim Hadi, presented evidence that a juror was biased against Lowe. At a hearing, she told Judge D. Gay Lowe did not get a fair trial because the juror had an agenda to convict her. You're saying here, and I understand that she lied under oath. Is that what you're saying? That's what you're alleging, and that's what the proof is? I believe that's what the proof is. Here's the proof. Gentle. The juror in question answered a questionnaire taken under oath asking if she had formed an opinion about Lowe. Her answer, that Lowe lied and killed her two newborns. It is the most striking, direct, harmful, prejudicial, biased answer that a juror can give. And here's the problem. The court record shows the same juror was later questioned again under oath by the DA during actual jury selection at the courthouse. She again is asked if she had an opinion if Lowe is guilty or not. This time, the answer was no. So the juror was not excused despite the obvious contradiction that no one caught at the time. Lowe's father remembers the woman's reaction when she learned that she had made the jury. She goes, yes, and then looks around just a little bit with her eyes, wondering if anybody saw her. 
Judge Gay said he had no choice but to grant Lowe a new trial, writing in his order, Juror 17 was untruthful and possibly lied outright about her preconceived opinion. The possibility of prejudice cannot be ignored, especially when Lowe is serving two life sentences. However, two years after this decision was made, the Tennessee Court of Appeals actually reversed the decision. They felt that there was not enough evidence to prove that this juror was biased or that they could have influenced the verdict. At the time, they reinstated her conviction, and by June of 2024, Lindsay was sent back to prison for the double murder. All throughout the trial, with this back and forth with the appeal, Lindsay's family has shown their support for her. They all say that she was mentally unwell and just made a horrible mistake. They still believe that she is a good person with a kind heart. Also throughout this, the father of those babies came out to say that he would have taken them. He wishes that she would have just told him about the pregnancy because even if she wanted no part in their lives, he would have taken them. Did you know that she was pregnant? Did she ever contact no, you? Never, not once. Now, four years later, Smith is finally talking about the moment he learned the horrible truth of what happened. Smith, who lives in Kentucky, says Lowe had cut off contact with him after their brief affair. But then months later, a Hendersonville detective called him out of the blue. He says, do you know Lindsay Lowe? I'm like, yeah. He says, did you know she was pregnant? No. And I'm like, okay. How are the baby? He said, babies, plural. He says, they're dead. At first, Smith didn't believe it. Lowe had a fiancé, but DNA testing confirmed Smith fathered the twins, two infant boys. Would you have been willing to take care of these children? Of course. Of course. I would gladly come down there and pick those babies up and give them a life. I'm a twin. They were twins. You, may, you imagine the bond that I would have had with those little boys. Of course, Smith never got the chance, but as you might expect, he says not a day goes by where he doesn't think about what might have been if Lowe had chosen another option. What really gets me is Tennessee's a safe haven state. Smith knows Lowe could have quietly given up the children, no questions asked, and they'd be with him today. It's an everyday nightmare. I wake up with it and I go to bed with it. Do you think you can ever forgive her for what she did? No, never. She's paying the price, but ultimately I'm paying the bigger price because I don't have those twin babies in my life. But again, instead of doing that, she knowingly murdered two innocent infants who couldn't possibly defend themselves, all because she saw them as an inconvenience to her. She had so many options, so many things she could have done, but instead she chose the most violent, selfish, and disturbing route possible. And for that, I am glad that Lindsay is in jail and hopefully will stay there for the rest of her life. As of right now, that is where the case sits. I think that Lindsay is an incredibly selfish person who not only didn't want to be a mom, but also didn't want to admit that she cheated on her fiance. So that is why I think she did what she did. But that is what I think. And now I want to know what you all think. What do you think of this case overall? Do you think Lindsay purposely killed those babies or do you believe she had a decreased mental capacity? Do you agree that she should be behind bars for the rest of her life? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy and I hope to see you next time. Bye.